Good morning, everyone. We will begin the today's session. Uh, today we have a webinar from the YBT Bootcamp, and the topic will be intellectual property rights management. And this will be given by Ms. Cristina Narvaez, an IP attorney. And just before we begin, and I uh, I give Cristina uh, the microphone. She, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Cristina's background um, and also talk a, li a little bit about the webinar we're going to have today and finally the rules of the game, how the dynamics of this webinar will, uh, will function. So Cristina is a Colombian lawyer. Uh, she graduated from Los Andes University, specialized in commercial law. She also earned a master's in intellectual property law from the George Washington University Law School here in Washington, D.C., where YIBT's headquarters are. Uh, she has worked in intellectual property department of the law firm Filippi Pietro Carri Sosa, Ferrero, Deu y Uria, and was a legal fellow at the Nature, Con Nature Conservancy, an intern for the Office of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression of the Organization of American States. Uh, she has more than five years of professional experience on intellectual property matters, and has focused her practice on the promotion of technology transfer and innovation management with a human rights approach. Uh, this is really uh, interesting. We are very excited to have Christina give this webinar. It's going to be of great help to all of you that are participating in a talent and innovation competition of the Americas. Uh, if you're participating in the Caribbean Innovation Competition, then we're really excited that you're joining us today. Um, just uh, last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about the webinar description. Um, today, intellectual property rights have the greatest potential to generate added value to companies. Uh, it is its versatility and scope of protection make them a strategic tool for entrepreneurs to venture into new markets and explore business opportunities. Uh, therefore, entrepreneurs should not neglect intellectual property management issues to the legal department or to external advisors exclusively, but must take them into consideration in daily commercial decisions. Um, today's webinar will provide a brief explanation on the importance of a comprehensive business approach to the intellectual property management policy, as well as the main strategies to align the intellectual property rights to the economic interests to gain and maintain a competitive advantage in the market. Uh, furthermore, the class will discuss issues related to the importance of a proper protection of intellectual property rights, and it will further review the strategic use of intellectual property to attract investors and build collaborative partnerships to foster technology transfer and innovation commercialization. And before I give uh, the word to Christina, uh, let me just um, explain to you uh, how this is going to work. We have uh, Christina's presentation, and towards the end of the presentation, we will have a couple of minutes for a Q&A session. This is where you'll, you'll be able to make your questions to Christina, and I'll read them out loud to you if you type down the questions, or I can also unmute your microphone, and you can make your questions through the microphone. So. If you want to type down your questions, there is a tab that's titled Questions. Uh, you can just click on that and type down your question. Excuse me. And once you type it down during the presentation, um, I will read them out loud to Cristina on the Q&A part of the webinar. So just to recap, during the presentation, type down your questions, because if you, if you wait towards the end to make the questions, you may forget what we were discussing at that moment. So my recommendation is that you type down the questions during the presentation. I will read them out loud to Christina when we are at the Q&A part of the webinar. Also, towards the end, if you want to make your question through the microphone, and if you have a working microphone, um, you, there's a raised hand button you can uh, push. And uh, when we're at the Q&A part of the webinar, push that button, the raised hand button. I will remind you towards the end as well. And I will unmute your microphone so that you can make your questions through there. So without further ado, uh, Cristina, your microphone is unmuted. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and take it away. Thanks, Jose. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, participating in this webinar. Um, please feel free to ask all the questions that you have, and I'll be happy to answer them towards the end. 
Um, as has I said, a proper IP management is key to exploit IP assets market wisely. Um, okay. So IP rights are part of the scale between knowledge generation and access to knowledge. IP rights provide legal and economic incentives to foster knowledge generation, but also the society wants access to that knowledge to use it um, to make their lives easier. For example, patents grant the privilege of exclusive exploitation uh, for a limited period of time, but in exchange, the inventor must disclose the research that supports the inventions and exploit the invention in the market. This allows inventions inventors to keep developing their project while the community benefits from it because one, um, we have access to the technical information so we can perform, perm, perform further um, research projects and two, we have a new product that improves our wellness or at least that's how it should be. Um, so I'm going to explain briefly the, difference, uh, the different types of IP rights. Um, we have uh, patents that protect products or processes and they entail a new way of making or a new technical solution. The invention must meet the following requirements to be patented. Uh, first, they have to be new. That means that no other invention in the world is alike. Um, it should be non-obvious in the US or have inventive step in, the, in countries with European law tradition. Um, which means that the invention provides a technical advantage beyond the state of the art uh, that is not obvious. Um, the invention will or should also be useful in the US or have industrial application in countries with European law tradition. Um, so the assessment of each requirement varies in some countries, but um, the requirements are pretty much the same. We also have industrial designs or design patents. They protect the aesthetic external appearance of um, a product that is percep perceptible uh, to consumers. That means that uh, it is protected what the users see of the product, the part that is external. Um, if it is in the inside, then it would not be an industrial design, for example, the appearance of the car could be protected by an industrial design, but the motor that is inside most likely wouldn't be protected. Um, a design must be new to be protected. There is a third option between patents and the industrial design. Some countries have utility models. They protect products that have a novel element of configuration and provide improvements to the product use, the function, or manufacturing. The requirements for acquiring a utility model are less strict than those uh, for patenting. The utility model must be new and uh, be non-obvious in the US or have inventive step in the European law uh, tradition countries. Mm. Another IP right are trademarks. Um, trademarks are distinct signs that identify products or services in the market as to differenti differentiate them from other products and services available and associate them with their so source. They are different, there are different types of trademarks from the most traditional ones such as the words or figurative like the apple here um, or a combination of both such as the Tesla logo, or more creative ones, uh, such as smell, taste, sound, like this one. Even new and more creative ways of uh, marketing are protected, such as um, gestural trademarks. 
like this one that is protected in Colombia on behalf of Nestlé. So that trademark identifies a gestural sign uh, with the hand on a new way of eating the cookie. Um, there are other types of distinct signs, uh, distinctive signs, like the slogan that aims to reinforce the trademark, the emblem that identifies business establishments, or the trade name used by persons or entities uh, to identify themselves while performing their business activities. Please keep in mind that domain names are not trademarks. Although domain names have become a key element for branding within the e-commerce realm, uh, they are not trademarks as such. Domain names um, are just an easy way to uh, code the web address instead of using the internet protocol addresses. So domain names may include trademarks, but they are not the distinctive sign and are, they don't convey protection on your trademark. Um, however, uh, please keep in mind that unauthorized use of others trademarks in the domain name may result in cyber squatting that is a way of infringement trademarks um, infringing trademarks online so registering trademarks is not equivalent to purchasing a domain name or vice versa and those are two different processes that should be done uh, in a coordinated way um, please keep in mind that the right to both patents and trademarks are acquired through registration in each country of interest so they are territorial and they are not universal um, IP rights. Um, we have also copyright and related rights. Copyrights protect um, original works fixed in a tangible medium um, now known, known or that will later, later be developed. Um, from which the works can be perceived or otherwise communicate, communicated to third parties. The key concept is originality, meaning that the work entails the expression of the author and is not a copy of other, other work. Um, abstract ideas are not protected, but the original way of expressing such ideas may be copyrightable. That explains why you can find different movies about Martians, uh, such as Star Wars or Star Trek. We all know they are two different stories. Um, Copyright is acquired by the author from the date of creation of the work, from the moment it is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Therefore, registration is not needed. Nonetheless, the deposit of copyrightable works um, with the Copyright Office is highly recommended as it provides suitable evidence of ownership of the work for any legal procedure in the future. In most countries, except the US, Copyright comprise economic and moral rights. On one hand, economic rights refer to the rights of exploitation of the work in the commerce through reproduction, publication, commercialization, public performance or display, or importation of copyrightable works. Economic rights may be assigned, encumbered, uh, licensed to third parties, or even used as collaterals. Um, on the other hand, Mortal rights refer to the author's attribution of authorship and other and the integrity of the work as created by the author. Unlike economic rights, mortal rights cannot be transferred to third parties, may not be waived, and are perpetual. Do, do keep in mind that works can only be created by human beings, therefore companies can only own uh, the economic rights, while mortal rights will always be owned by the author of the work. Mm. Related rights are those of singers and actors, as well as photogram producers and broadcasting organizations. Um, another IP right are trade secrets. And uh, it refers to, the, to a secret information that has economic value because it is secret. Trade secrets will last as so long as 
uh, the information is kept secret. Usually, applicable laws require implementing security measures to ensure that information will be kept secret, such as executing non-disclosure agreements, um, I will talk later about it, um, implementing logs or um, dividing the information for it not to be like free to access and that way it won't be easy to, to spread. Um, traditional examples of trade secrets include the Coca-Cola recipe and the Google search algorithm. Okay, so protecting is important um, for different reasons, but I'm going to talk about three major um, reasons. Regarding the risk of infringement, uh, protecting IP rights will raise your awareness over any possible infringement of third party rights for you to avoid it or even prevent you from infringing. Also, it will deter others from using your technologies, and if they do, you will have legal remedies to stop them. By protecting the IP rights, you will prevent others from protecting the same technologies and, that, and thus you will be able to use it and exploit it exclusively. Um, regarding uh, the losses, so protecting IP rights and manage them wisely will prevent you from investing resources in technologies that have been protected already, uh, that others have developed, or that you may not be able to exploit. So that way you will prevent or, or protect seeing the IP rights will prevent you from invest, investing in a project that is not profitable. And finally, protecting your IP rights will help you gain and maintain competitive advantage in the market. That, that's like self-explanatory because you have the exclusive right to exploit an invent or a uh, development, then you'll be able to keep um, others from using it and be able to have the competitive advantage if you use it wisely. Mm. For this to happen, legal departments must be uh, seen as a strategic partner. Um, IP attorneys must be included in the decision-making process in order to establish the protection strategy in accordance with the economic interests of the business. This is key. For example, protecting patents and trademarks in countries where they will be exploited is important because if you protect in more countries that where, where you're not going to go or you're not interested in, you will waste economic resources. And also, if you protect in less countries and then it happens that you will be exploiting your patent or your trademark in other countries, um, you, will be, you will leave your technology unprotected. So um, being able to include IP attorneys in the decision uh, making process will favor a preventive legal practice, which is strategic and planned. A preventive uh, practice will establish uh, in advance the costs and order in order to measure them and control them. Also, this type of legal advice will identify contingencies and establish strategies to overcome them. So you won't have surprises down the road that will cost you even more money. Like would happen if you have IP attorneys that are not linked to the business or are never part of the decision making process. Um, this is not wise uh, because it could lead to unforeseen contingencies that require immediate attention, unexpected and less controlled costs. Also, not taking IP into consideration could have a reputational cost with consumers and investors that will see, um, because they will see that the startup or the entrepreneur does not have control over, the op their, over their operations. So. Um, acting impuls impulsively or in a not organized manner will scare investors and also will alert uh, consumers about maybe not a, a like a wise management. Okay, so like 
uh, important conclusion of including IP attorneys in your daily decisions um, is that the proper IP management is key to achieve the following goal. First, an efficient management of resources, as I said already, um, the costs associated with uh, protecting and enforcing IP rights can be planned and afforded. I just want to highlight that IP rights are not commodities that only large companies can afford when their protection has been planned and has been incorporated into uh, the business strategy of the startup. So even in a lot of cases, IP rights could be the only asset of a business enterprise and will be okay if you manage it wisely. Um, also, fundraising is much easier when an when you have like an organized and enforceable IP portfolio because that reflects positive um, uh, and reflects a positive image of the company or the startup or, or the entrepreneur um, since it will increase the trust among the investors. Um, don't forget that IP rights can be used as collateral so maybe banks or any other investor would be willing to invest in your project if they can uh, have your IP as collateral. Um, and finally, it facilitates strategic partnerships because a proper IP management allows you um, and allows the party, the parties to establish the ownership of their developments and the scope of the collaboration. So having explained why it's important to have a proper IP management, I will explain several legal strategies to um, help you implement uh, a proper management of your IP portfolio. The first one could be the IP due diligence. Um, it is an IP audit that will allow you to establish the current status of your IP portfolio or that of others as to identify contingencies that could um, affect your operation. Although you can run IP due diligence at any time you deem necessary, I strongly suggest to carry out due diligence in the following events. One, before entering in a collaborative partnership, the IP due diligence should be done on your IP portfolio and that of your potential partner. Um, second, uh, before selling, acquiring, or merging with another startup or entrepreneur, if you are selling, you do not have to perform a due diligence on the buyer, but if you do like end up acquiring or merging with any other um, startup or entrepreneur, um, I most certainly suggest that uh, you perform a due diligence um, on the other on the other party's IP perf uh, portfolio. And third, before taking strategic uh, business decisions that could have an impact on IP portfolio, that's basically any any decision. Um, I recommend performing due diligence on a regular basis to confirm that your IP portfolio is up to date and is enforceable. So you don't have like any kind of surprises while you were like counting that this trademark was registered and it ended up being denied and nobody told you and you made like this huge decision for branding in this country and then you end up unprotected. Um, so the basic steps of a due diligence include first, identify IP rights used by the startup or entrepreneur. Um, that means finding the inventions that or the works uh, that could be protected under any IP right described that I described earlier. Or, and also find all the IP rights that uh, have been protected already. Um, second, establish the ownership of, of those IP rights. Um, keep in mind that the workers and contractors should have entered into an assignment agreement in order to transfer the IP rights to the startup or entrepreneur. Um, make sure that the agreements cover all the IP rights created and the scope covers all the uses that you need uh, for you to exploit the right in the commerce. Um, third, uh, confirm the enforceability of the IP rights. That means not only that the rights have been protected, protected pursuant the law of each country or the applicable law, uh, but also that the maintenance require, requirements to keep them updated 
have been met, otherwise they will be null and void. Um, additionally, that the scope of protection actually covers your invention or the trademark as you intend to use it. Um, although copyrights are acquired from the creation of the work, I already said that it is highly recommended to deposit the work before the Copyright Office as it provides suitable evidence uh, of the ownership of the work um, for any future legal proceedings. Um, and finally, identifying infra infractions uh, that includes any misuse of a third party IP rights or non authorized use others have uh, or are making of your own IP. Also, find potential contingencies. For example, if a trademark or a patent um, is not being used correctly, they could be subject to a cancellation action in the case of the trademark or a uh, mandatory license in the case of the patent. So make sure everything is in order, not only the legal work, but also how the, 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 the business is using those IP rights is important. This is another example how IP attorneys need to be, or need to be um, included in daily uh, market decisions. Um, so the information collected is useful to make business decisions or to make strategies to avoid eventual contingencies. Um, Another tool are uh, searches. Uh, so they allow you to make like a bench marking with a legal twist. Um, searches are performed before the trademark and patent offices uh, for different purposes. First, you can check the availability of the invention or the trademark you intend to register. Um, it'll allow you to know what has been protected or filed for registration. Uh, you can use the results to establish whether your application would be barred um, for registration or if somebody has developed an invention similar to yours. Um, then you could change your R&D project to develop something different or contact the owner of the um, invention that has already protected, that has already been protected and enter into a collaborative um, partnership or something similar. Um, this search is also useful for trademarks, so if you find something similar to identify similar products or services, you can either change your trademark or your logo or the design or enter into a license with the person that has already um, registered it. Um, there are a lot of options. Um, the freedom to operate search uh, is mostly used for patents. Um, the results will analyze the patent that the patents that are currently protected and valid in certain country um, uh, that could bar your invention from being commercialized there. Um, it is used when you cannot register your patent, but you still want to commercialize the invention in that country. And uh, finally, well, competitors and products and services. It'll allow you to track your competitors' activities before the patent and trademark and trademark office so you can just see how many patents and trademarks they are filing in which uh, field or which products they are covering and so on. Um, well, the same happens with the product and services. This search will allow you to keep track of the activities in a particular field, so like maybe um, different technologies uh, you want to, to to look and you have them like monitored. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the contracts. Um, contracts or certain contracts are key and must be included in your daily transactions in order to help manage your IP rights uh, wisely. Um, for example, the non disclosure agreement must be used to protect trade secrets and also RD projects that are not ready to be patented. Yes, just yet, but that you want to keep like a uh, secret in order to, to, to be able to decide whether you want a patent in the future. Um, it is important to define in a clear manner uh, what is the confidential information or what does that mean because if you leave it really wide uh, like aiming to protect as much as you can then you might end up uh, falling in uh, in general um, or, or not clear 
uh, statements that would uh, not prevent the uh, people or your contractors or your advisors from leaking the information. Mm, an assignment contract uh, transfers the IP right that the previous owner uh, and transfer the IP rights to you and the previous owner will not retain any 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 rights unless otherwise said in the contract depends on how you negotiate that and what are your um, main objectives um, but you should use this agreement with workers and contractors to ensure that your startup is the owner of the IP rights um, and finally the license is an authorization to use the IP right uh, but the other person will retain the ownership of the rights. It can be exclusive or not exclusive or to certain territory and you can mix and match however is convenient uh, for you. Uh, but remember to include the, in the license all the rights, uses and fields of use that you will need to exploit the, the rights um, in the market. So that's it for today. I hope uh, that what I said um, is useful and you are welcome to make as many questions as you want. Thank you so much, Cristina. Uh, thank you for all the information you have shared with us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the Q&A uh, part of the webinar. I, um, I invite all the participants to type down their questions on the questions tab. I will read them out loud. Or uh, Christina, or uh, also, you, if you want to make a question through the microphone, you can uh, push the raise hand button. I see there's there are a couple of uh, of raised hands at this moment, so I will we can start there and see if uh, if people have um, raised the hand to actually speak, or if it was just trying out the button. So Ernest Humphrey, uh, if you're able to hear me, I will unmute your microphone, Ernest, and you can make your question right now. Go ahead. Ernest, can you hear us? Okay, so that's probably one of the tests. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lower everyone's hand and at this point if you want to make a question during your microphone uh, using your microphone you can push the raise hand button again and I will check in a bit we're gonna start with the questions that have been typed down uh, the first question comes from Joel Rouse he's asking if you're using IP from another country do you need permission from owners to work in another country with that IP Um, well, it depends. Uh, certainly, IP rights that are territorial, like trademarks and patents, uh, if they're not protected in a particular country, you could say or you could argue that it is free for use because they're not protected there. Uh, but do keep in mind that unfair competition uh, regulations apply and if they are able to prove that you have been using that in an or the, the the invention or the IP right in an unfair way uh, in the market then you will have a negative impact in your in your in your project um, so I would always recommend even if it's not protected and you know that it is protected in other countries like to be aware that uh, you can you can be subject to um, any kinds of law that apply to protect uh, competition and unfair competition laws apply. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. Um, there's a question from Mark Forgini. Um, he's asking, dear Christina. Um, what about ancestral knowledge that is then improved on to allow for a new and novel design or operation? Are payments to the ancestral group required by law or is this voluntary? Well, it depends on the country and it depends on the regulation. For, um, I don't have that really clear for uh, the 
for Colombia and for the CAN, like uh, the CAN, um, that's Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, and Ecuador, they do have a regulation of ancestral knowledge. Um, typically, the country will have strict regulations on that, and they will not only ask you to pay uh, the, the indigenous people or, or the owners of the knowledge, but also to ask them permission and to work closely with the community. Sure. So, so in that case, because um, Mark doesn't really tell us where, where, what country is he asking about, but is there a, a particular um, institution and governments that you could approach and ask them uh, what the law is, or is this just with the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property, or what, what would you recommend? And uh, Marcus also just saying that he's from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, so he's asking uh, uh, the West Indies. Uh, well, why we certainly have a lot of uh, information on that. Uh, I mm, I could check if there is like a international treaty and which countries are part of that, so you can like uh, share that information with our audience. Uh, but also, I would definitely check with um, trademark and patent office of Tobago or any other country for any other. Uh, like person that wants to work with ancestral knowledge. Perfect. Great, thank you. So let's go on to, to the next question. Uh, this is coming from Karen Ann Gardier. It's, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, she's asking, how would IPRs, intellectual property rights, pertain to a product that has a geographic indicator? What IPRs should be considered? And she makes the clarification that by geographic indicator, she means that the product has value because it has been identified as being produced in a particular area. Um, okay, so you are talking like something about like champagne or right. whiskey. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, right. So, so, so the question, once again, just to, to, to recap is how would IPRs pertain to a product that has a geographic indicator and what intellectual property rights should be considered for these types of products? Um, well, they are distinctive signs and they should be registered before the trademark office um, of, of the country where the origin comes from. Um, another alternative could be like a certification trademark and also the case, for example, of uh, Juan Valdez, that is like a trademark from Colombia uh, to indicate uh, or to, to identify Colombian coffee. Um, it doesn't say like Colombian coffee or champagne, or it's like a region from France, whatever, but it is also that it has been like built on uh, how Colombian coffee, um, it's like a great coffee. So you can have like a different strategy, not only with geographic indicators, which should be registered with the trademark office, but also um, any other alternative like certificate trademarks or uh, branding uh, strategies. So again, it's like a collaborative effort with the legal department and the business um, like strategy. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, Oral Lawson uh, is asking, and this is a, a, a I guess, timing uh, type of question. So he's asking if content of a piece of work, um, for example, a poem or a song, is already posted online by the creator, what kind of IP protection can be obtained at that point? Um. For whom? Like for the owner or for the person that wants to use that? So for the owner, so, so let's say that I'm a songwriter and I create a song and I post it online without any IP protection. Afterwards, can I get some IP rights or is this if it's too late if I have already published it? Okay. Um, well, remember that uh, copyrights uh, are acquired just because or for the cre because of the creation of the work and as from the moment that it is uh, made on a tangible me medium. So if you 
type your song lyrics and you publish it, um, you're already protected because copyright in most countries does not require any previous um, uh, like registration or requirement. So it is not only already protected in your country but also in the rest of the world. Um, yes, so you already have those. If you want to like uh, reinforce or like to really make the like due diligence, you could go and deposit the lyrics before the copyright office. Um, but it is not too late to protect it. It has been already protected by copyright. If it was a patent information or a trade secret, then it's too late because that is not how they work. But with the copyright, it is like that. Great, great, great. Thank you for that. That's a really good answer, really clear. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, another question from Trinidad and Tobago. This is uh, from uh, Alpha Senan. Uh, he says, I have invented a superhero character that is getting global appeal and are presently launching in various countries. Would I need to register intellectual property rights for the character in each country? He also says, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, this is not like a legal advice for your particular case, but um, do remember that copyright uh, protect in certain countries characters. Um, so you would have to like identify which are the original features of the character so you, it, ha it is protected uh, by means of copyright. Also the drawing of your character, I'm assuming like this is like some kind of like manga or something like that, like Mickey Mouse or um, comic. Uh, so the drawings will certainly be uh, protected by copyrights, but also you could explore the possibility of uh, protecting the drawing or, or your character with a trademark. Um, however, you should analyze what, which kind of services or products your the character trademark um, would identify in the market and if you can later prove that you are using it according to the registration for you not to be subject to a cancellation action. Um, but that's like the options that I would explore, but I think you should like consider like talking with an IP lawyer um, for an to analyze your particular case. Great. Thank you so much. So we're uh, almost at the end of the Q&A uh, segment, so if anyone has uh, an additional question, feel free to make that question at this moment. Um, we have, uh, we're going to do two more questions. Uh, the first one says, at what point should entrepreneurs start taking actions to protect their intellectual property? Is it when they are still in an idea phase or when they have already consolidated their MVP, their minimum viable product? So I guess the question is, if uh, when should they, should entrepreneurs start um, taking actions to protect IP, uh, whether they're still thinking about starting the business and have a great idea, or if they already have a product? That's one of my favorite questions. Um, well, it depends. Uh, because there are so many different IP rights that could apply for the different uh, like development stages of the project you should combine and you should yeah you should combine them to to have like uh, protection along the way so for example if you have a really good idea that you have shared with your partner or you just want to develop it on your own but you are like making um, all these research and developments uh, of like I don't know a process to build something uh, then you should take the steps to protect that information with a non-disclosure agreement and also try to find uh, arguments uh, to, to, to say that it would be a trade secret because the result of that research or that, yeah, that uh, research and development project will have uh, 
value in the market by being secret. Uh, later on, you can just define whether you are interested in patenting the uh, like the product that you um, have developed. Remember that for patenting, uh, it should be like a little bit into the testing uh, stage, but be careful, uh, like not to to wait too much, and then allow anybody that is working on the same project part and then like in a parallel uh, time to file a patent first. And then when you are about to launch it in the market, you could protect the trademarks and the distinctive signs and acquire uh, the domain name. Although if you have like a R&D company, uh, you could have like used your own trademark to offer the R&D services and work on your private project uh, like in a parallel basis. So you, you could just, just mix and match. And also copyright can apply at any stage because you don't have like to register it so the documents and the research and your conclusions and your drawings and everything uh, that you have produced and put in a tangible medium could be deemed as a literary work, literary work or, or any creative work and so long as it is original it should be protected. So yeah, it depends and you can just mix and match on the stage of your of your development, but do not neglect the IP and don't like remember IP when you are about to launch it. So keep it in mind from the beginning, from the moment you say, ha, ah, I have this idea. At the same time, this will be like my trade secret and so on. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so we we do have a couple of questions left. I hope uh, we, we can we have the time to answer all of them. Um, Josanne Mark is asking, uh, if you take an invention that has been in existence for a very long time and use it in a novel way, can you protect it? Um, can you get some IP protection for that? Um, okay, well, you have to be careful with that because uses or new uses of a, a well, like already known Invention in some countries are not uh, subject to protection, but if you have like a traditional um, object that you have, I don't know, for example, a iron, and then you make an iron to be wireless and intelligent and Bluetooth and well, you have like this new arrangement of elements, you could think of protecting it uh, with maybe a patent of this new composition or a utility model, as I mentioned before, um, or, or if you have like this really ugly object and you make it beautiful with a new uh, design, maybe you can have like a design patent or industrial design protection. Um, so yes, the answer is Yes, you could have an old uh, thing and then modify it as to be protected, but you have to like analyze what laws applies and if under any applicable law you could be uh, subject to protection um, and also like meet the requirements for the protection. It can just be like, oh, here is the new use of this and if it's obvious, then you won't be able to protect it. And also, some jurisdictions don't allow new uses to be protected. So that's what I should consider when when doing this like rearrangement of the already known product or or um, process. Perfect. Uh, let's move. Um, I know I said we had just <laughs> one more question, the last <laughs> question, but these are really interesting questions. So, so let me just, uh, if we can quickly tackle them. Christina, uh, uh, there's one from Matt, Matt, uh, excuse me, Mark Forgeny. It's a really good one. He's asking, Dear Christina, what rule of thumb are used in evaluating the intellectual property rights within a business model? Uh, is the Do you use the direct commercial income value or the secondary and tertiary commercial values that can potentially come from the product? That's for evaluation of the IP asset? Yeah, yeah, within a business model. Huh, well, um, I'm not an expert on valuation of IP assets. 
Um, so I would say that I won't be able to give you like a rule of thumb right now. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You, you, it's a, it's a tough question. It was really interesting. Uh, okay, well, we can do one more uh, then. Thank you, Mark, for that question. Um, we have the last question from Joel Roos. Um, he's asking two things. First, um, if he can contact you for further information on IP. And second, if uh, can an IP attorney work in different countries to various clients? Um, okay, sure, you can contact me, of course. Um, we'll later work on how you can have access to my email. Um, and yes, so long it is like authorized to work in those countries. Also, most of us, uh, what we do, we, we have like uh, a really large uh, like uh, net of uh, sister offices in each country for 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 our clients to to have like a prompt and a comprehensive uh, service. Um, and what we do is like uh, we try to manage all the inquiries from the from the client from one office so that the client won't have to deal with a lot of lawyers and uh, it's like centralized um, only in one mm, but a different uh, one one lawyer can actually work in different countries if he has the permission and the license to work in them in them and yeah I don't see why you can't have different clients so long as you don't fall into a conflict of interest like advising two really competitors or uh, any other conflict of interest that may arise from advising two clients. Perfect. Thank you so much, Cristina. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, it's been great. It's a really interactive session. Uh, it has been really helpful. Uh, for everyone here, um, and uh, Mark for Denis also has a last comment saying, "Okay, that's great info, uh, and thank you for your presentation." So that with that said, let me make a segue uh, and uh, remind you all that this session has been uh, recorded, so you're going to be able to to access this presentation and also access Christina's uh, PowerPoint presentation. She has been kind enough. To, to share it with us, uh, and you'll be able to download it and view the, the, the recording of the presentation at the YBT Bootcamp uh, webpage, which I'm showing you on, on the screen right now. Uh, you can go to YBT.net and access there, or if you want to access directly the, the YBT Bootcamp platform, just type on, uh, on the field YBT.net slash bootcamp and you're going to be taken to this website where you'll be able to check out the upcoming activities as well as uh, choose a category and view the videos we have on each category. So look forward to uploading this recording soon. It's going to be ready uh, towards the end of this day or uh, tomorrow the, the latest. Uh, as I said before, we have a lot of other uh, training videos you can look at, uh, at the recordings and also download the presentations which will be very helpful uh, in, in, which, in whichever stage you're in in your project. So with that um, uh, we're going to close the session not without thanking Christina for uh, a truly um, really good presentation, great interaction with the audience. Thank you so much for everything you've shared and Christina uh, you have the microphone for uh, for the for this goodbye for the goodbye remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and thank you everybody for coming to my webinar. It was really fun talking with you, and I'm so sorry for the evaluation question. I was not able to answer it. Um, this might be the opportunity to offer a new webinar uh, on valuation, IP valuation, to which I will certainly um, attend. Um, and well, thank you very much, everyone, and I hope the information was useful for you. Good luck with everything. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Christina Narvaez, IP attorney. Thank you guys for joining us today, and have a good day. Goodbye. Bye.